Hi and welcome to Rust 101. This is video 15. My name's Andy and today we are talking about probably the hardest thing you'll hit at the, your beginning of your Rust understanding journey, which is lifetime bounds. So we're going to go through it quite slowly. I've got some examples. Um, I'm going to try and make it clearer than it might have been so far for you. So what is a lifetime bound? Well, so let's remind ourselves um, of what lifetimes are. So lifetimes are a little bit of information that we add to a reference um, to say how long it's going to last, but it's um, it's simpler than it first looks. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna look at this example that I've got on the screen. But first of all, I think this example is quite difficult. Um, I'm going to show you an, what I think is an easier example that I knocked up earlier. So here is our example. So the function we're focusing on is this between function. So let's first of all look at how it's used. So uh, in the, in our main function, we create a little uh, thing called example. This is a reference. This is Amstra, um, and it's got this just got some like HTML like markup inside it. But it's basically this is just a str, uh, static string reference, uh, and then we call the between function, which is the one I've written. Pass in that uh, example string str. And also pass in two other references, a beginning and an end. And basically what we want to get out from between is uh, what's between the two things we passed in. So it's going to say this sentence. So let's just run it. Well, we can't run it yet, so we can't quite see the example because we're getting some compile errors. And because this between function isn't quite finished, and we're going to finish it off by adding lifetime bounds. So let's just show you a couple of examples. I've written a load of tests for this code. Obviously, it's me. Um, so let's have an, an example of, uh, yeah, let's look at this example. So um, if you pass in, if you call the between function and you pass in xxx start, yy end, zzz, and you say, get me the stuff between start and end, you should get back yy, right? So which is why this assertion says yy. So that's all it is. You just give it um, the thing and then the start and the end start marker and the end marker, and then it gives back whatever's in between them. So the implementation of the function doesn't really matter, but let's just do it just, in, just to make sure you're clear how it works. So we take in these three references to str, and we return a reference to str. And that's important that we're returning a reference. And we go looking for the start marker. Uh, and if you don't find one, we just immediately return an empty str. Um, and then we... Once we found one, we like move forward by the length of that marker and go looking for the end marker in the rest of the string, because here we've sliced the string to say, to start from after the start marker, find the end marker. If we don't find an end marker, also we return an empty string. By the way, that might not be what you want this function to do, but that's what we've done just for simplicity. Um, and then the final return value of this function is a slice from the start to... So basically, the end of the start marker to the beginning of the end marker, which is what this start plus end gives us. So we just slice the string we were given uh, and return that slice. So what's key to notice about this function is that it returns a reference. If it returned a string uh, that, that was owned by the person who gets it back when they called this function, we wouldn't need to do anything. Um, this function would already be fine. But because we return a reference, we have to tell Rust some information about that reference that we're returning. So I think this is an absolutely key point to make, that when we add lifetime bounds, which we're going to do in a second, which are these tick A things, tick B, and stuff like that, um, the reason why we do it is so that Rust knows what to do with the thing that we're returning. It's nothing to do with the code in here. Rust can read and understand the code in here fine. Rust needs to know when I'm calling this function, what am I allowed to do with this reference you've given me back? So let's think about what the Rust compiler has to think about when you call between. Well, the point is, Rust is normally able to just figure out like which th what thing lives for long enough. So for example, this example here, this is actually a static str. Um, so this is going to live for as long as we need it to. Uh, but what Rust has to figure out is what am I allowed to do with this tag content thing that you've given me back? You're giving me back a reference. Therefore, it doesn't live forever. It refers to something that's owned by someone else. But who owns it? How long have I got um, before I have to say, you're not allowed to use this tag content thing anymore? So let's try and construct an example where 
we do something right or something wrong. So let's imagine, we're, instead of these being static strings, let's make them be um, re own strings. So let's say, let, uh, let's call it imp equal um, a string. Uh, let's have it do, what should we do? XXX, and then a space. And then this is what we want to return, and then a space. No, let's let's do, let's not use spaces, let's use, let's use curly brackets, shall we? And then Y, Y, Y. So we want, when we call between, we want to get back that this, right? So we've made a string, but now let's also make some more strings. Um, let's make like um, a start and an end, so we'll call them S and E. So the start is just going to be curly bracket, and the end is going to be the other curly bracket. And now we're going to call between. We're going to pass in a reference to imp, a reference to s, and a reference to e. So, so far this probably looks fine. We're going to get the answer into a variable we're going to call answer. Let's call it answer so I don't have to say ants. Um, now the question is, the question the Rust compiler has to decide is, what can I do with answer? So if I wanted to say print out answer, like this, um, I just want to print it out. In fact, let's just say answer equals answer like that. So that's all going to work fine, right? Um, it, oh, sorry, it should be answer. Um, this looks like reasonable code, like nothing wrong with it so far. The, the Rust compiler should accept it, so we should definitely add lifetime annotations that make this look okay. But what if we did this? What if we dropped S? Would it still be okay to run this code? Well, yeah, because between returns a reference to some part of imp. It doesn't doesn't care about S. It had, it's finished with S once you've finished using the between function. But what if we did this? What if we dropped imp? So now imp is dead. So now the Rust compiler should say to us, you can't, you're not allowed to use answer because it's a reference to something inside imp and imp is now dead, right? So the whole point of lifetime annotations, the reason I've been waffling on about this code up here is because lifetime annotations are not for this function. They're for people using this function specifically to know what can I do with this reference? How long does it last? after you return. So the way we do that is we say we say we say to the Rust compiler there is some relationship between the references you've been passed in and the references you return. In this case we only return one. It's nice and simple. So how do we describe the relationship between the references that have been passed in and the references that we return? Well what we do is we make a lifetime parameter, a generic parameter, which is a lifetime parameter. That's what this tick A means. The fact that there's a tick there means um, that this is a lifetime parameter. And then we say there's a, there's a relationship between this input that got passed in and this reference that you return. So we say they have the same lifetime. This one and this one have the same lifetime. Um, and I think that might be enough. So what I was going to do was and say, okay, well, these things, they have a different lifetime. So I'm just going to say tick B on these. They have a different lifetime. And I, I actually just looking at the compiler errors that I'm getting. Maybe I didn't even need that part. But yeah, so the point is, if I made all of these, let's get rid of, okay, so let's get rid of the line with a bug in it for a second. Uh, but we're still dropping the S, which we think should be fine. If we made all of these the same, so we got rid of this tick B, and we said everything that gets passed in is a tick A. And... This, the thing that gets returned is a tick A. So we're basically saying uh, these have all got the same lifetime as each other. And the reference we return has the same lifetime as that. Um, so in that case, this is a compiler right now. Um, because answer is now tied to the lifetime of S. And we, we know, because we've read this code in this function, we know that that's wrong. That's not the case, that the lifetime um, of this return value, which is a slice of input, is not related to S. The S can be deleted, and this thing will still be valid because this is referring to a bit of memory that's just inside this input thing, which is the imp here. So we've done it wrong. So what we're going to do is change that and say, no, these things are different. 
There are two lifetimes. There could be, we could do three here, we, and we could, we could name them I, S, and E or something that might make it easier to understand. But the key thing is, basically, we're saying we don't care about the lifetimes of these. Then our output, our, re- our return value has no relationship to these things. They're just a different lifetime from our return value. But our return value does have a relationship in terms of lifetimes with that input. Because when we return it, we're returning a reference to some memory that's owned by whoever owns input. So if we run the code now, it should compile. And the test should pass. We'll try that out in a second. And then we'll, yeah, there we go. So it, it behaved as we expected. It said this sentence for that first bit, and then it said this for the second bit. But now if we put in the drop and run the code again, we'll get a compile error. And it's the correct compile error saying answer is a, a borrow of imp. And answer gets used. Like, if we didn't use answer later, this wouldn't matter, because that's the way li- lifetimes are so clever that they know that. But we are using answer. And answer is a reference to inf. And inf has been dropped. Now, this is a slightly artificial piece of code, because you don't normally, like, uh, actually explicitly drop things like this. But it gets the point across, I hope, that the, the thing, this answer is actually a reference with the same lifetime as references to imp. And we, the way we've expressed that is we've said tick A here is the same as tick A here. So this return value is has the same lifetime as input, but it doesn't have the same lifetime as these two things, so we don't care. That's why we can drop S. So hopefully you now have a bit of a, an understanding of why we annotate a function with lifetimes. It's nothing to do with Rust being able to figure out whether this code is correct or making sure that this thing lives long enough inside here. All it is is, when I return stuff, what can I do with it? What lifetimes that you've given me have a relationship to the lifetime you've returned? Now, let's just try, just for fun, because I noticed I wasn't getting any, er- getting any errors. Maybe we can just miss out this tick B, and it'll still work. Yeah, it's fine. And let's run our tests just to check. So we've got a load of tests in here, just checking that between works the way it should. Of course, because how could you write code without writing the tests first, which is what I did. All right, so back to the example that they're using in the slides, uh, which is a nice example, but it's a bit harder to understand. So um, this this function, the reason it's difficult to understand is because um, it's the relationship between the return value and the inputs is more complicated than it was in my example, where it was, ob- it was obvious there was just one uh, one reference being passed in that had th- whose lifetime we needed to kind of specify for the reference we were returning. In this case, we've got a complicated function where um, we're being passed in two strs. Again, they're using strs because str is a good example of this. It's just an example. Any ref- all references work the same way. Um, so what it says is, if a is longer than b, then return this a. Otherwise, return this b. Saying, give me the longer one. So as you can see, um, this is going to have the same kind of lifetime problem that we had before. When when Rust is trying to compile code that calls longer, it needs to know which um, what how long is the lifetime of this return value? Is it re- refer- re- related to A or B? Or in this case, it could be either, which is tricky. So here's the here's the error message we get. Basically. Missing lifetime specifier means normally I work out your lifetimes for you and you don't have to worry about it because it's obvious, basically. Like if there's only one reference passed in and one reference returned, it's obvious. And that's one of the cases where the Rust compiler just works it out for you. Um, But here it's saying, I can't work it out for you. I expected or I needed uh, a lifetime parameter on this return value because I couldn't figure it out because the return type returns a borrowed value, but the signature doesn't say whether it's borrowed from this thing or this thing. So hopefully this compile error now is making a bit of sense maybe because of hopefully the way I've explained it we'll see um, so what they're saying is maybe you should add a lifetime parameter just like we did earlier and say that a and b have the same lifetime as each other which is the lifetime of the return value um, and that's what they've done and I think in this case it's correct so they, I don't think there should be a distinction in this case between the left and the right um, with the they should both have their lifetime tick A because essentially uh, it could be either of them. So we've got to say basically all these things 
I've got the same lifetime effectively. Like it essentially Rust, the compiler just chooses the shortest of the options it has when it's compiling code that calls this longer function. If, if they're both the same, it says, oh, well, I better use the shorter one. Um, so what we're saying is, yeah, let's, let's, let's go through. This is a really helpful way of putting it. Given that we've got this lifetime, uh, tick A, this generic parameter, um, then longer takes in two references that, that both live for at least tick A. So basically the compiler finds the shortest of the two that you're passing in and says, oh, left and right live for at least as long as that shortest thing. And the return value of this function also lives for that same lifetime. So this is, this is them trying to say the same thing that I was trying to say earlier, which is, um, annotations don't have any effect on how long variables live. What they do is tell the Rust compiler the relationship between references so that when you call this code, it can figure out the new lifetime, you, the new reference you've just given it, how long that lives for, and then it can warn you, like it did us, oh no, you're dropping something when actually you've still got a reference that needs it. So, um, yeah, so I think what this slide is trying to say is um, that the Rust compiler, like I said, the Rust compiler can figure things out inside a function absolutely fine. It's already got the information it needs. Um, and, and where we add the lifetime annotations is when we're telling Rust how to deal with it, like, what's happening within a function. Now, in theory, probably Rust could work out um, these things for us and just do it for us by examining the inside of the function um, and then using that to change, like to kind of un like change how it sees that function from the outside. But Rust has this um, convention that functions are kind of independent. They stand on their own um, and we don't need... Um, other context in order to use them. So I think that's, I think that's what this question is about. Uh, it's a really good convention. Like you, uh, like just for your IDE to understand the function or just for like locality of stuff that makes everything easier to deal with. Functions are kind of independent from, um, where they're called and stuff like that. Okay. So we've done functions and I, and in some sense, that's the bit that I think you really need to get your head around. But the bit that gets really annoying is that you need, to, whenever you make a struct or anything like that that contains a reference, you always have to have a lifetime annotation. So again, um, the reason for this is so that code that uses it knows how to understand these lifetimes and specifically how the lifetimes within that struct are re related to each other. So the rule is, if you have a reference of any kind in your struct, you always got to have a lifetime written next to it when it's in a struct definition like this. Um, or, or I guess also in an enum. Uh, so that means you need this generic lifetime parameter here. So first rule of thumb, um, if you get lost in this stuff, uh, just don't have references in structs. Like references in structs are, are slightly hard to think about. So start off by just not having them. Just have things you own, like a string instead of a ampersand stra or something like that. But if you're doing something, for example, you're returning something which represents, I don't know, a... Um, I don't know, three subsets, three subsections of the same str or so, you know, whatever it is. Like if you, if you're struct in some way, it fundamentally does refer to something else and you don't want to make a copy of it or you can't make a copy of it, then you're going to need a reference type in your struct. And that, in that case, you're going to need to deal with, um, having this generic lifetime parameter, tick R or tick whatever, um, uh, as one of the, um, generic parameters of your struct. And you're going to have to annotate each thing inside your struct, every each reference inside your struct to say what its lifetime is. And quite often, you're just going to want one lifetime uh, for all the references in your struct, or you're only going to have one reference in your struct. And that's just straightforward. Just do that. Um, and don't worry about it. Um, but where it gets interesting and useful is if you have multiple, if your struct contains multiple references and the, the things it refers to could live for different lengths of time. Now, normally they're just all going to live for the same length of time because it's essentially they're all referring to something else that's all owned by the same person. But if they're, if they have different lifetimes, you're going to need multiple, um, lifetime parameters and each reference is going to get a different letter after its tick. So, yeah. Um, so what else to say about that? Um, so now that you know what lifetime bounds are for, 
hopefully that will help you think about when you're going to need this more complicated situation within a struct where you've got multiple different lifetime parameters. So don't worry about it until you need it. Just put, give them all the same lifetime for now. And at some point you'll realize, oh, hang on, these two things have different lifetimes and it's messing me up and I'm going to need to set them up. But he, you don't do much with these things. Like in a function, you can like read the code of the function and decide, okay, well, I'm returning a reference to blah. So my, um, my return values lifetime must relate to my input in the following way. It, with reference, with structs, um, you don't really do anything. It's just that it's got to be there because Rust wants you to be absolutely explicit when you're, um, when you're holding onto a reference in, in a type like this. Um, what the, um, what these things are referring to and what their lifetimes are. Okay, so you may be asking yourself, um, why haven't I seen this all over the code? If every time I return a reference or someone returns a reference to me, I have to say where it came from or, or what lifetime it shares with the things that are passed in. And the answer is, the Rust compiler does something called elision, which means um, figuring it out for you, as I mentioned earlier. So, um, yeah, lifetime elision is essentially just figuring out um, or guessing making a good guess at what the lifetime of your return value is based on the shape of your function. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, what the Rust compiler does by default is if you've got multiple uh, input lifetimes, as in parameters to your function, they each get a distinct lifetime parameter, as in they're all treated as if they're all different. Um, but if there's exactly one, then... Um, one input, then all your outputs are considered to be the same lifetime as that input because what else could they be, right? You can't you can't return a reference to something you created in the function because that's already dead by the time the function ends. So it must be, uh, or so, rather, you can't return something that's owned by stuff inside the function. So you must be return if you're returning a reference, it must be a reference to something that was already owned before the function was called, right? So if you're only passing one thing, then obviously the return value is going to be that. Um, but there's also a more of a heuristic rule, which is um, if it's a method, so if it's got an ampersand self or ampersand mute self or whatever, um, then uh, we assume your return value is going to have the same lifetime as self. So that makes sense, right? If you're if you're calling uh, methods on an object that has a lifetime, it's quite likely the the return value. If you're saying like get name, it's quite likely that the reference you return is the same. Like that name is going to be owned by the the object you're calling the method on. So if that's wrong, by the way, you can change it by just providing explicit lifetimes. This is just what the Rust compiler will guess if um, uh, if you don't put any annotations on. Um, and if it can't guess because you're not in that situation, either where there's exactly one input or if you've got, if you're a method, um, then it will tell you like the message we saw, which is like, I can't guess this. Okay, so some examples. Um, uh, yeah, if you've only got, so if you haven't got a return, then it really doesn't matter, right? You're always going to get just, it's just going to make one up for you. So you're allowed to write this. If you've got two things that are being, so this again, this has only got one reference parameter. So it's only going to make up one. And then again, you can ignore it because there's no return value. If you're returning something, but you're only passed in one, then the compiler will guess and say, look, let's just say there's one. Uh, and the return has the same lifetime as the thing that got passed in. Um, if you're returning a reference and you weren't passed in any references, then you're doing something impossible. So um, that won't happen. And it's not strictly true because it could be something with a static lifetime, uh, in which case you'll need to say tick static on this, I think. I think. Um, uh, but if you're, if you're passing in two references... And there's no way for the compiler to guess what the what the lifetime of this return value is. This is the situation we were in. In the examples we just looked at, um, it won't guess. It'll tell you, you need to tell me. But if you have a method that um, is, that if you have a function that is a method that has a reference to self, and we're returning a reference, it will guess that the this lifetime is the same as this lifetime. And that's true even if there are other references coming into this Um this method. It will still assume that it's the lifetime of self that you're returning, unless you explicitly tell it, which you absolutely can do. Okay, so that was just um, like a sidebar on why on how Rust guesses, which isn't the main thing. The main thing is um, that that the return the lifetime parameters are to tell Rust the relationship between the return 
value references and the incoming references because it needs to know what to do with that return value in the code that calls this function. Uh, and that's it for um, a lifetime bounds. Uh, if it doesn't make sense, maybe just watch it again or ask me questions. I'm uh, really happy to try and answer your questions. Uh, either comments under the video or ping me on Mastodon um, or whatever there's links underneath. Um, comments on my blog as well is fine. I, I'll see all of that. Um, uh, yeah, so next video will be me trying to run through some of the exercises for this section because we've got to the end of section A3 in the slides and then we'll move on to more exciting stuff after that. Thanks a lot. Hope you enjoyed. See you next time.